Good evening and welcome to the last um, Latino Latin American Studies program event of the semester. Um, tonight our talk is Understanding Immigration, Law, and Policy with a Focus on Latin America by Mary Kramer. Mary has been practicing immigration law in Miami, Florida for over 20 years, focusing on criminal alien issues, complex asylum, advice to defendants facing criminal, alien, um, criminal prosecution, and cooperating witnesses. She's the author of the popular law book, The Immigration Consequences of Criminal Activity, a Guide to Representing Foreign-Born Defendants, in its fifth edition. Um, she has a position on the 2013-2014 American Immigration Lawyers Association National Department of State Committee, as well as the Access to Counsel Task Force. Um, from 2011 to 2012, she served as AILA National's Immigration and Customs Enforcement Liaison Committee Chairperson. Um, Mrs. Kramer serves as chairperson for liaison committees that meet with enforcement and removal operations and the Florida Department of Motor Vehicles. In the year 2001, um, Mary was the president of AILA, as South Florida chapter, an organization of over 600 immigration lawyers. She's currently president of the Board of Catholic Legal Services, the largest service provider of immigration law assistance to low-income non-citizens in Florida. That and a lot more. <laughs> um, she's a graduate of the College of St. Benedict, um, Minnesota cum laude in 1985, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Law in 1988. Um, Thanks for coming, Mary, tonight and giving her second talk tonight. Very active, even when you're visiting um, your alma mater. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Are you all able to hear me well in the back? All right, great. Good evening. Thank you for coming. So, I have a daughter, Elizabeth. She's 17. And she's a junior in high school. And like many students attending Catholic high school or public high school, she has a community service hours requirement. So this past December, just a few months ago, um, Liz and I decided to volunteer together at a Christmas party at a shelter for unaccompanied minors who had traveled to the United States illegally without parents or a guardian. In Miami, there are several shelters for children that have been arrested by immigration and customs enforcement. Some are run by the government and some are run by the Catholic Church. Organizations that provide housing, food, education for children, but they also guard them and detain them. I am the president of the Board of Catholic Charities Legal Services in Miami, so I knew about the Christmas party and I said, Liz, here's a great community service opportunity. So just a few nights before Christmas, Liz and I drove over to a shelter. And if you can imagine, we got there early and the room was full of tables and I thought, gee, they're not gonna be able to fill up so many tables. And there was a Christmas tree and there were gifts under the tree because each volunteer was expected to donate a gift. So a group of young kids came in and they started to take their seats at the tables most of them, I'm going to say, were around the ages of 11 or 12, but some were much younger, and I thought, wow, these are, these are a lot of kids. I didn't expect this many kids. But then another bus pulled up, and another 60, 70 kids got off the bus. And then another bus from another shelter pulled up, and kids started to file in and take 
the chairs and the tables. The room was filled with over 160 children, ages four, age four. Does anyone here in the room have a three-year-old or a four-year-old brother or sister? Cousin? Yeah. Three and four-year-olds were in that room. All the way up to 18. They check your teeth. Once they think you're 18, they put you in an adult detention center. Now, the majority of the children were boys. Vast majority. Oh, there were girls, but the majority were boys. And I asked a colleague who's very involved with that particular project, why so many boys? And she said, Mary, for the, for the most part, it's too dangerous for the girls to come because there's an assumption they will be raped. So there were some girls and there were some little girls, but they were mostly boys. And my colleague was funny, you know, there were counselors there and they were all dressed, the counselors, counselors were all dressed in matching yellow shirts and interacting with the kids, but my, my colleague called them the jailers. <laughs> um, so Liz and I initially went from table to table serving the food and, and the drinks. Very, very polite, quiet, nice kids. And then there was a gift raffle and every, every child in the room was given a gift for Christmas. And then a lot of the attorney volunteers just sort of just started to stand around, not really knowing exactly what to do and how to interact with the children. They had a DJ. Some of the kids were dancing. Some of the kids weren't. But I said, I said to Liz, you know, we're going to dance. we got to dance. She said, oh, God, Mom, please don't dance. So I said, okay, well, then we need to talk to some of the kids. So we sat down at a table and we started to talk to a group of four boys. Um, and we, we started sort of fooling around and teaching them some English phrases. And one of the boys actually had studied <laughs> some English and he spoke English. And we were teaching them, hello, how are you? And they were, again, just very nice and, and polite. And then we asked them about their experiences. These four boys, I think three were from Honduras and one was from Guatemala. Is anyone in the room from either Honduras or Guatemala? I, I should have given you a warning at the beginning. I'm very good at putting people on the spot and asking questions of the audience. That way I avoid questions. But anyway, so I think they were like 14, 15, 16. And they all told us a similar story. They said, back in our towns, everyone dreams of coming to the United States. And in this one boy's case, coyotes actually lived in the town and you knew who the coyotes were. Does anyone not know what a coyote is? A coyote is a smuggler, a human smuggler. And he said, you know, everyone just sort of saves and dreams of coming to the United States. And this particular boy came with his little cousin, a girl, like a five-year-old cousin. And um, he said they were so hungry on that trip. And at one point on the bus, somebody shared with them an old sandwich, like a stale sandwich, and they split it in half. And he said, I was so happy to have that sandwich. Um, another boy told me that they crossed into the desert, into Arizona, and he said it was nighttime and the coyote lost me. And I was walking through the desert with another boy for like an hour and a half at night just walking around and we were lost and we didn't know where we were going and then the group found us and he said I've never been so scared the boy who came with his cousin told us they were stopped by border patrol at a bus station they were arrested they went to the border patrol station and he said the border patrol agent shoved me down and hit me and they took my cousin and I still don't know where my cousin is and I'm so worried about her. So Liz and I listened to these stories and then I, I asked the boys, I said, well, was it worth it? Are you glad you came? And they all looked at one another and they paused and they said, you know, when you're there at home, when you're in your town, you really want to come to the United States. <clears throat> but when you're in the middle of making that trip, you really, really regret it. You really regret it. So the night came to an end, and Liz and I decided it was time to go, 
and we got into the car and everything was fine and we were driving away and I said, Liz, what did you think? And my daughter exploded into tears. And she's not a particularly emotional girl. And I, I was shocked and I, I looked at her and she was just crying. And she said, Mom, it's so awful and it's so unfair. How can I go, how can I go to the mall tomorrow with my friends or go to the movies or just hang out at the beach? Knowing that those kids are not free to leave that shelter and they've never seen a mall and they're not gonna go to the movies this weekend and all they're gonna get is that one gift at Christmas. Why is life so unfair? And I told Liz, you know, obviously I didn't have the answer to that. I don't know if anyone in the room has the answer to that, but I certainly didn't have the answer to that. But I said, honey, life is unfair and you've been given a lot. And what I want for you to do, what my prayer for you is, that as you get older, you will always remember to give back and to help the people around you. Now, those of you seated in this room are very, very fortunate. It's a tough world out there, full of, full of pain and, and tremendous injustice. And you're sheltered from it here. And I know some of you struggle to go to St. Ben's and St. John's. <clears throat> and I know some of you have the support of your families and some of you don't. And some of you are just barely pulling it together and counting pennies. And some of you are doing pretty well. But you're very, you're very sheltered here and you've had dinner tonight and you're gonna go home and you're gonna sleep in a warm bed. And that's a lot more than some very small children around the world have. St. Ben's and St. John's is a magical place where you can learn and you can ponder and you can grow. And here you are among the haves instead of the have-nots. Your teachers, your professors, your mentors, the nuns, the monks, have a, have a dream for you that you will be nourished in spirit and intellect here and that you will then go out into the community and you will help those who do not have. I'm humbled to be here and to be able to speak to you and I just want to convey to you that I'm very glad you're here and I hope you're glad you're here and I hope you will use this time at St. Ben's and St. John's to be nourished and to go out and to seize the moment and to take the world by storm because there's so many people who need you and who need your help. So let's talk immigration. I hear people say time and time again that the primary reason people come to the United States is financial. Now that may be true, but that hasn't been my experience as a lawyer in Miami. I want to give you a quick overview of immigration law from my perspective as I practice it on a daily basis with a focus on Latin America, although certainly I have clients from all over the world. Foreign born people come to the United States to join their families, to be reunited with their families who are, always, who are already here. Foreign nationals come here because they're business women and men and they seek to expand their companies and their businesses and their corporations. Foreign people come to the United States to study and there may be foreign students or J1s in the room here tonight. So they come for a better education. Foreign students end up very often staying here and working in the United States professionally. In South America, Venezuela, Argentina, Colombia, people come to the United States very often on business or investment visas. And again, many, many young people from South America come on student visas. There are many, many types of business visas. Now, why am I starting with a quick discussion on visas? Because I think sometimes the American people have a distorted image of what is the immigrant and what is the immigrant problem. And the fact of the matter is there are many people who cross the border illegally and are engaged in low-end labor. But there are many, many people 
who come here legally to study, to invest. They're scientists, they're great athletes, they're doctors, and they're creating jobs for the American people. So, just a little bit of Immigration Law 101. You'll get credit in law school later, all right? We have business visas. We have the H-1B. That's a professional visa for people who at least have a bachelor's degree, but there's a cap. A few years ago, Congress said, oh, you're competing with Americans. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. So they put a 65,000 annual cap. Only 65,000 people can have H-1Bs. There's O's and P's, which are entertainers and athletes and movie stars that just have extraordinary ability. So your entertainers, your singers, your rock stars, your movie stars, they may be here on an O or a P. There's the L1 and the E. The visas all have letters based on the section of law. So you have intercompany transferees. There may be a huge corporation in South America and they have a subsidiary here. Or maybe they'd like to open up a subsidiary here. So they send an executive manager to run the company. The E-Visa is an investment visa or a treaty trader visa. The E-Visa is based on treaties that we have with the different countries. All right, we have other visas. We have religious workers. Um, I bet if we were to go over to the seminary this evening and start counting monks, we'd see that maybe as many as 50% are actually from a foreign country and they're here on a religious worker visa. We have cooperating witness visas. We have witnesses that are cooperating with the FBI or with the CIA or with the DEA. They come in on cooperating witness visas. Obviously, we have student visas exchange visitors and then of course we have the catch-all tourist visa but non-immigrants are thriving in the united states and contributing to the american community in so many ways some of your teachers may be here on on visas temporarily you just you never know many many doctors many many medical doctors are here on J-1s, or some other type of professional visa. Now, here you see a visa bulletin. The other type of immigration are the immigrants, the permanent residents, people who are seeking permanent residency in the United States. And by and large, that is divided into two categories. That can be people who are immigrating based on family, their dad petitioned for them, their mother petitioned for them, their spouse petitioned for them, or a brother and sister petitioned for them. And the reason I'm putting this up here, this boring chart, and I know it's boring, and I know some of your eyes are glazing over, but just stick with me. One of the things you have to understand about immigration is that we put caps, we put numerical limits on the number of people who can come. And when we put caps on the number of people who can come, you have backlogs, you have waiting lists. And as you can see, we, we have extraordinary backlists, special groups for people from China, Mexico, India, and the Philippines. They wait even longer. So if your dad is here and he's applying for you to come from Mexico, you're gonna be waiting. You see that November 1, 2001. Your father is here, you got a home here, maybe your mother is here, you're waiting 12 years to come here. All right, and then we have the employment-based list and different types of employment, the first, the second, the third category, based on how much education you have, what sort of career you have. Again, we have waiting lists where you see C, the letter C, it's current. And if you have somebody sponsoring you for a job and you're current, you can come right away. Otherwise, you're gonna wait. And there's a lot of people here in the United States who entered lawfully and they have job opportunities and they have an employer who wants to sponsor them and they may have specialized knowledge and they're the only people who could fill a certain job but they're on a waiting list for visas because the law contains numerical limits as to how many people can immigrate even though they have a sponsor now another important area of the law is refugee or asylum law now just because you're in danger or somebody threatened you, 
or you feel that you're facing harm, that does not mean that you are a quote refugee. A refugee is somebody who's going to be persecuted because of their political opinion, their race, their religion, their ethnicity, or their membership in a social group. What is a social group? Well, I don't know, you tell me. The courts have said a social group is a certain unique group that is identifiable and stands out in society. So some examples of social group would be a Jewish person in the former Soviet Union or in a country that persecutes Jews. That would also fall into ethnicity. Um, gay orientation in countries that persecute and harass, and, and it has to be more than discrimination, homosexuals, all right? Um, it could be women, could be gender-based in a country where there is extreme violence against women. Could be Christians in a country that persecutes Christians. Now, here are some immigration court asylum statistics from just a, a handful of countries that I grabbed um, looking at Latin America. Now you see received, granted, and then the final column is supposed to be denied. The immigration court is not the only entity that can grant asylum. So don't take this too seriously. There's also separately an asylum unit. There's an asylum office. If you don't win asylum from the asylum office, then you go into deportation proceedings in front of the immigration court. But as you can see, and, and by the way, if the numbers don't add up, it's because the column that I cut off from this screen are people who just withdraw or abandon or don't show up to court. But you can see, for example, El Salvador, 2,991 people from El Salvador applied for asylum. 191 people were granted, 1,126 people were denied, and they get ordered deported. Now, in Miami, we have a large Cuban population. There's a law called the Cuban Adjustment Act. Has anybody here besides Gary Prevo heard of the Cuban Adjustment Act? <coughs> besides Jose Alvarez, has anyone heard of the Cuban Adjustment Act? All right. But you've been studying Latin America and you've been studying South America and Central America. You all have some familiarity with most of these countries, okay? Well, Cuba is special. Cuba is special. <laughs> Cuba has the Cuban Adjustment Act. If you are a Cuban national, which could mean, by the way, that you were born in Spain of Cuban parents or you were born in Venezuela of Cuban parents and um, you were paroled or admitted into the United States and you've been here for a year and a day, you apply for residency, you get it. None of you have heard of the Cuban Adjustment Act? Some of you have heard of the Cuban Adjustment Act. All right, it's a really good law for them. All right, now, we also have a provision in the law called Temporary Protected Status, TPS. TPS is when we give temporary refuge to a nationality that's been designated, used to be designated by the Attorney General of the United States, now they're designated by the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security because they have suffered in their country either political or environmental upheaval. And they are allowed to stay and remain in TPS and they get a work permit. And it's in year increments. Right now, people from El Salvador, because 11 years ago there was an earthquake, Nine years ago? When was the earthquake in El Salvador? Haiti had um, huge hurricanes and an earthquake. Honduras, Honduras has been designated since 2000 because of Hurricane Mitch. Uh, Nicaragua, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and very recently Syria. Now what happens is these, these, these nationals, these people, they do get work permits and they have the opportunity to work and they send remittances, they send money home, they send money back to their native countries. And then it becomes a political issue because those remittances are so needed and so valuable that their governments end up lobbying our governments to keep the people in TPS status. All right. 
So that gives you sort of an overview of immigration law. If you've come here legally, you hope that you will be able to get residency based on a family sponsor or an employment sponsor. We have many non-immigrants here, people that are here on temporary visas. We have asylees, we have refugees, and then we have the undocumented, the people who have just come on tourist visas and overstayed, stayed too long, or the people who have crossed the border illegally. And there are estimates, nobody knows for sure, you know, but there are estimates of what, you all might know the statistics better than, than I because you've been studying this, and, and actually as a practicing lawyer, I don't sit around really and think about the statistics, but what are they, 10 million, 11 million undocumented people living in the United States? A lot, all right? So that is an overview of, of immigration. And what I do in my practice, you know, I do a little bit of like family petitions and, and just some, you know, clean, don't get my hands dirty applications. It's not that interesting stuff. I do complex political asylum, has to be a good asylum case, has to be interesting, has to be something I can sink my teeth into, use the knowledge that Gary Prevo gave me when I was a college student. And I represent a lot of people in deportation proceedings who have been convicted of crime. I represent people who are not in deportation proceedings yet they're charged with crime and I partner up with the criminal lawyer and we try to fashion a plea agreement or a plea bargain to some sort of offense that they will not face deportation. I do a little bit of everything. I represent a lot of permanent residents applying for citizenship, applying for naturalization. Um, and I help, I, I, I help them with their cases because maybe they have some difficulties in their background, either a criminal record or some record of fraud, or maybe they fibbed to get their residency and now they'd like to become citizens and that little lie is coming back to haunt them. So that's the kind of thing that I do. Um, immigration reform and the Obama administration. What I would like to do is just be straightforward with you and Frank, and I'm, and I'm not sure I'm gonna talk the party line, but I'm gonna to express to you how I feel, and I'd like you to know that, I, that I'd like to hear your point of view, and there's no right or wrong point of view because this is complicated. And in this room tonight, anyone is welcome to get up and express their point of view. You don't even have to be politically correct, you just have to be polite. Anyone who tells you that the immigration issue is not complicated is not being honest. Now, what bothers me about the whole issue of immigration reform is I feel like, I feel like from our congressmen and women and the Obama administration, we're getting a lot of hypocrisy. And I also want you to know in my opinion, for the camera, my opinion, only my opinion, not, not the opinion of St. Pans or St. John's, my opinion. The press very often gets it wrong. So when you're reading about immigration or listening to the news, you've gotta be careful. Because as someone who practices immigration law, not five days a week, but unfortunately six days and sometimes seven days a week, I can tell you they very much get it wrong. An example is this pathway to citizenship phrase. What's a pathway to citizenship? People don't want citizenship. Do you know what citizenship is? Citizenship is when you become an American citizen. There's a whole bunch of steps in between. And we're talking about people who don't have a driver's license. We're talking about people who don't have a work permit. We're talking about people that may already have a deportation order in their back pocket, a piece of paper that says you've been ordered deported. They don't care about citizenship. They want to be legally here. They want to have a work permit. They want to have a driver's license. They don't want to be scared if they see, you know, the flashing red light in the back and maybe they're being pulled over because a tail light is out. They just want to be legally here. And they would be grateful to not be afraid. So the pathway to citizenship, I don't know who coined that phrase, but it is a misnomer. My opinion, camera, my opinion, all right? 
people would like to eventually become permanent residents and have that famous green card. The reason it's called that is because the plastic card for many, many years, up until about 1990, had a green color. <coughs> so I think the pathway to citizenship phrase is very misleading, and I think it tends, in my opinion, to hurt the immigrant cause. Immigration reform is also a political football. And I, I apologize if I sound cynical. But I believe that very few congressmen and women truly care in their hearts about the plight of immigrants. I think they're looking for votes. And if you're in a district that is very conservative and doesn't have an immigrant population or doesn't have a strong Hispanic presence, you're against it. And if you live in a community where you have a strong Hispanic constituency and a lot of immigrants, well, then you're for it. Now, the Obama administration has conducted, has executed record deportation numbers. More than any other president of the United States. And I was for two years the chairperson of a committee, a national committee that would go to the Department of Homeland Security in Washington and we would talk to them about ICE policy and detention and deportation on behalf of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. It was a pretty good gig. I learned a lot. And they announced to us certain policies. And they said, we're going to focus on our priorities. And we're going to focus on the really serious criminals. And we're going to focus on the gang members. And we're going to focus on the people who have molested children. And we're going to have priorities. And they announced their priorities. They put their priorities in writing. But statistics don't bear it out. And what we have are record numbers of people with American citizen children, with American citizen spouses who've lived here for 10 or 11 years, who've never committed a crime, being detained, locked up two or three months, and deported. Now, Obama has done good things for the immigrant cause. How many of you are familiar with the program DACA? <coughs> Is anyone familiar with DACA, D-A-C-A? -A? Anyone on DACA? Everyone here was like just born and bred in Minnesota or? Que pasó aquí? All right. I know one of you wasn't. DACA is the acronym for Deferred Action for Youth. And it was a program announced two years ago. And if you don't know what it is, I'm here to tell you. You have a friend or a neighbor or a roommate or a cousin of a roommate who is here on deferred action and knows what DACA is, which is another point I would like to bring up. The immigration issue touches all of us. And all of you have a good friend with immigration problems, whether you know it or not. Or you go to church with someone with a family that has immigration problems, whether they've told you or not or your best friend, or your brother and sister's best friend, they have immigration problems, and some people stay in the closet and they don't tell you. I, I get, okay, I digress. I'm really good at footnotes and tangents. I, I, I get a kick out of it as an immigration attorney when I talk to somebody who's not involved in immigration law, and they're not involved in immigration issues, and they'll tell me, well, you know, or you know, they'll call me for help because their next door neighbor's been arrested. You know, he's different. He's not like the other ones. Or he's not like all these Haitians coming in on boats, these illegal aliens. He's different. Or she's a good one. She's one of the good ones. Because you see, everybody's in their lives are touched by immigrants. And there really are no good ones or bad ones. There's a lot. Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of good, good people. And, and if you stereotype non-American citizens, and you throw them in, into a box, you're really not being fair. You're really not being fair to them. But in any event, deferred action for youth was an Obama administration policy. It's, I shouldn't say was, it is, it's ongoing. That if you came here before the age of 16, 
um, and you are in school or you earned a high school diploma um, and you've completed a degree and you're under 30, because you came here and you were brought here by your parents, not of your own free will, and you, you've gotten an education or you're in the army, you, you can stay here and have a work permit. And for the most part, in every state, if you have a work permit, you can get a driver's license. Although in some states, the governors are not nice, and they'll say, oh, if you have DACA, we're still not giving you a driver's license. Florida is one of them. So, deferred action is great, and it's changed the lives of a lot of young people, and I'm, su I'm sure that there are people here on DACA at St. John's and St. Ben's. Um, but my colleagues, we find it interesting that six months before the election, Obama comes out with DACA and overwhelmingly gets the Hispanic vote. A representative who I really admire and I think is sincere and really cares about immigrants is Luis Gutierrez of Chicago, Illinois. Very articulate, very, very sincere. Otherwise, I'm sorry, I tend to be skeptical and I see the immigration issue as a political football. Now, one of the reasons that I am skeptical is because people are talking about immigration reform in a grand scale. And a big part of immigration reform is legalization and granting residency to the undocumented people here. And that's what everybody's talking about and that's what people are upset about. Well, we need a wall, well, we need greater security, well, we need legalization. We already have an immigration law, and we have a system and a structure in place. I showed you the charts. We have family-based immigration. We have employment-based immigration. You have a family sponsor. You have an employment sponsor. You have a company sponsoring you. You have a special talent. You have a special skill. You're a religious worker. We welcome you. The immigration law really needs some adjustments. We don't need a big grand plan. Let me give you an example. Congress could just increase the visa numbers. There are bars in the law, barreras. There are some very nasty, ugly bars that were put into the law in 1996. A bar, an unlawful presence bar says, if you came here and you stayed illegally, and then you got married and your husband has applied for you, or your mom becomes a citizen and your mom has applied for you, or you have a company because you've earned an engineering degree and your company applies for you. If you leave to your home country and you go to the American Embassy to collect your visa, well, guess what, you can't have it, you're gonna be punished. And you're gonna face an unlawful presence bar and you're not able to come back unless you can get a waiver. Eliminate that bar. Eliminate that bar. We have another bar that immigration attorneys call the permanent bar because it's a 10-year bar. And it's called the permanent bar because there is no waiver. There is no waiver. I call it the We Hate Mexicans law. Because it applies primarily in reality to the Mexican people. Do you wanna know what the permanent bar is? You come in illegally, you're here for a while, you go out, and you come back in Ill illegally again. In, out, in again, out. Permanent bar. Now let me help you visualize who that affects. You're a Mexican national, you crossed into the United States, you've worked very hard here, maybe in agriculture, maybe in your own business, Maybe you're a professional, maybe you're a laborer, you meet the love of your life, you get married, you have two kids, your father dies back in Mexico. You go to Mexico to the funeral, you bury your dad, you come back in. Your wife, American citizen, born in Cleveland, Ohio, files a petition for you. You've never committed a crime. Well, technically coming into the country illegally it is a crime, not generally prosecuted. But you went in illegally, you went out, and you came back in. Maybe your niece had a first communion. You went out, 
you came back in. Maybe your mother was very sick, you went out, you came back in. You can have a crystal clear record, married to an American citizen, children, job, home. You face a permanent bar and there is no waiver. Eliminate the bar. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not gonna get you a lot of votes. It's not particularly sexy. It's not a real attention grabber in front of the cameras. Everyone's talking about a pathway to citizenship. A pathway to citizenship. We have to have a pathway to citizenship. Give this man a work permit and let him follow through on the application his wife filed for him. And the reason I call it the I hate Mexicans law is because it just obviously applies to Mexicans. Other countries, other nationalities can do that, but because Mexico borders the United States more often than not, it really hurts the Mexican people. And it's ugly and it's unfair because they're here and they're contributing to American society and they're working. But because once or twice maybe they snuck back in and came back in again, they face a permanent bar. 245I was a law that we had up until, surprise, surprise, September 2001. September 2001, it was up to be extended by Congress, died on the floor. 245I was a law that said, if you were eligible for residency through a job offer or a family member, you could pay a fine of $1,000 to waive the fact that you entered illegally. Pay a fine and you could adjust your status in the United States without leaving. You know, that's a lot of money. We need that money. The United States needs that money. But the, but the fine was eliminated because congressmen said, oh, you're rewarding illegal immigration. There are so many people in the United States who are married to citizens, whose parents are citizens, who have American citizen children, who own homes. It's shocking. And they are your next door neighbor. And they're the person seated next to you in church. And, and guess what? They're in your classroom and they're going to be sitting behind you in class tomorrow. They may even go down the elevator with you tonight in this building and they don't have documents. A little bit of tinkering with the law. Some, some adjustments. Compromise. <clears throat> You're in a Benedictine liberal arts institution. The immigration issue is complicated. You have to be willing to listen to the other side. And there are people that have genuine concerns. And that's why I have this screen. Unemployment is, in the United States, hovering between 6 and 7%. And the professors in the room can correct me, but I think that even that understates it because it's based on whoever collects unemployment compensation. Really always about 5% higher than that. Yeah. So that would put us at, I have math anxiety, 13%? OK. <laughs> a large part of my practice, and I make no bones about it, I, I enjoy it and it's very challenging and interesting, is representing non-American citizens with criminal records. And here you have some statistics. FBOP is the Federal Bureau of Prisons. They report that approximately 26% of the people in federal prison are not American citizens. 8% of all inmates in state prisons are foreign born. <coughs> There are some immigrants who commit crime. Surprise, surprise. And that, that is a concern for people. And there are criminal organizations and gangs that are based on certain nationalities. Um, and that is a concern for people. And when you talk about unemployment and the labor market, you're talking, remember, I, I want to defy your stereotypes tonight. We're not just talking about, you know, Mexican or Central American laborers. Mexicans can be professionals and they can invest and South Americans are businessmen and professionals and scholars. Unemployment is across the board. Whether you're working class, middle class, or you have an advanced engineering degree, you could be looking for a job and feel like you're competing with a foreign born worker. 
That's why there's a cap on the H1B. But I want you, because you go to a Benedictine liberal arts institution, to dig a little bit further and ask why really primarily are the Republicans opposed to immigration reform? And I want to talk about money. And I want to talk about the private prison lobby. Now when I start talking about that, does anyone already know what I'm talking about? And I sent some materials over to the school, a lot of materials on this issue. I think it's shocking. I think it's shocking and I think it's a story that most Americans do not know. Detaining, imprisoning, incarcerating, whatever verb you choose, Incarcerating human beings is big money, big, big money. <laughs> and for the most part, the Department of Homeland Security has moved away from government detention centers, and they rely very heavily instead on private corporate prisons. And the two biggest industries are GEO and CCA. Have any of you studied this or know what I'm talking about? But the professors in the room know what I'm talking about. I question whether the Republicans that want harsher immigration laws and harsher penalties and they want to detain and they want to deport truly want to do that or they've been lobbied by the prison industry. CCA in 2012 made $1.7 billion in revenue, a quarter of which came from contracts with ICE. You see, our government isn't really building prisons anymore. Prisons, is now, prisons are now part of the private sector. And, and these industries, you know, you can buy stocks, bonds on Wall Street. And, um, they lobby Congress for harsher laws, for the three strikes you're out. Build a wall on the border and put detention centers along the wall so that we can detain the illegal alien. What is their interest? Your job? No, it's money. And they have incredible, incredible influence. ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, signs contracts with them. And ICE commits to a certain number of beds. So I sign a contract with you, Geo, and I promise you that I'm going to pay you for 300 beds. Whether I fill them or not, I'm gonna pay you, Ms. Geo, for 300 beds. Guaranteed, whether they're filled or not. That's our contract. That's our 30 year contract. Now, if you are an ICE official at a very high level in Washington and you are reporting to Congress, do you wanna tell Congress during a hearing, I'm sorry Congress, the American people paid for 300 beds in Shreveport, Louisiana, but we didn't arrest the immigrants, we didn't detain them, we only filled 200 beds. What, you only filled 200 beds? Well, we paid for 300 beds. There were 100 empty beds that we paid for. So you see the contracts and the detention policy ends up directing what we do. Am I explaining myself? Thank God I see one young woman nodding her head so I know at least a couple people might be getting it. We also sign contracts with county jails. And there are many rural areas in the United States that are not doing well financially and economically. And the senators and the representatives lobby that that jail in their county be given a government contract with ICE. And, and we'll put people there. And we'll make money. And you know what? They agree. They agree to a number of beds. 
And once you've signed a contract for a number of beds and it's going to be paid for, you want to fill those beds. Is anyone here from Elk River? But you know Elk River, just a little bit south of St. Cloud. They have a big jail there. What is that county? Sherbert County. Shri Sherbert County. Sherbert. Oh yeah, I remembered it by ice cream, Sherbert. Okay. <laughs> Noah, is anyone from that area? Hundreds of undocumented people or permanent residents who've committed crime are de detained at that jail. And the sheriff got a really good deal. He got a 30-year contract. Who signs a 30-year contract? Would you, any of you in this room, business major or not, sign a 30-year a contract for anything? The federal government signed a 30-year contract. And the immigration detainees are housed right alongside the criminal detainees. And every two hours, there's a lockdown. Every two hours, there's a lockdown and they count. There is a website that you should look at, TRAC, T-R-A-C. Fascinating. And it monitors the different immigration detention facilities. It monitors and surveys the different immigration judges and it keeps statistics on immigration law. According to TRAC, nobody at the Shreve, Sherburn? Sherbert, Rainbow <coughs> Sherbert. Nobody at the Rainbow Sherbert Jail speaks Spanish. There's no real visitation at the Sherbert County Jail. Have any of you ever, you don't have to raise your hand, just stop and think. Have any of you ever been in jail? Or known somebody in your family or a good friend? Oh, people are volunteering their friends and raising their hands. <laughs> Have you ever known anyone to be in jail or in prison? You don't need to raise your hands, but think about it. You want to visit your family member or your friend, right? You can't do it at that jail. They have no visitation, not even through a glass. You have to, what I call Skype. The only way to visit is through a video camera. And they, you, knew, you know this? Have you been there? Okay. Hopefully on the other end of the visiting side. Yeah. But you know what? There's no shame in going to jail. Innocent people go to jail. People make bad mistakes, whatever. I'm a lawyer, so I see no shame in going to jail, but I digress. So they have a huge waiting room, kind of like this room, and there's desks and little tables and computer monitors. And you get to Skype for 10 minutes. And if you go on the website for the Sherbert County Jail, you'll see that you can pay to Skype from home. What convenience. Now, if you were detained, guilty or not, would you like to see your family? Would you like your mom and dad to come visit you? Would you like to have a human touch once in a while? A hug, how are you? It doesn't happen at the Sherburn County Jail. I think that's a huge human rights violation. Does anyone think, I mean, am I just off on a mental tangent or is that a human rights violation that you are imprisoned and you can't see <clears throat> your family and friends? Go on their website. It's a half an hour drive from here. I would like to see students protesting in front of that jail. How do you not let a detained human being see a visitor? Money. My detention is big money, ladies and gentlemen. Big, big money. You go on their website, oh, just pay us this, this amount of money, and you can Skype with your loved one from the comfort of your living room couch. I don't want to Skype with my loved one. I want to see my loved one. 30-year contract with ICE. Nobody, according to track, camera, I could be wrong. According to track, nobody there speaks back. I'm a very emotional person, and I, I had a client there, and I, I always briefly hug my clients when I begin meeting with them, and I briefly hug them when I'm done. And I say something like, animo, va a bien, which means, you know, be strong, it's gonna be okay. Gave them a very quick hug, 
Nothing inappropriate. I mean, look at me. Am I capable of doing anything inappropriate? <laughs> Gave him a quick hug. But you can't hug him. In Miami at the jail, we can hug. All right, so. <laughs> I ask you to consider when the politician, most of the time the Republican politician, nothing against the Republicans, say the immigrants are taking our jobs, the immigrants are, taking crime, uh, are committing crime. Ask them if they get any money in campaign funds from the private, private prison industry. It's your job to listen and to be respectful of other people's opinions. And I want to encourage you to always listen before you speak. Listen to the other person. There are generally two sides to every story. But then ask questions and dig. I'm extremely disappointed in the political debate surrounding immigration law. I see a lot of hypocrisy. I see people for it or against it who really don't know at all what they're talking about. And it's just about the camera and it's about the votes. So I encourage you to always listen, to ask questions, to think. The only way you're gonna understand the issues is to do your own research. The papers don't get it right. Television news certainly doesn't get it right. And it's not about citizenship. These people want a license, they want a work permit, and they don't wanna be afraid. And I have no idea if I've gone too long or too short, but at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the audience to ask questions. You are more than welcome to disagree with me. Um, and to state your opinion, I respect what everybody has to say. Are there any questions about immigration law in general or some of the political issues we've talked about? Yes. Um, you didn't really talk about this, but I was just wondering what your point was on the constitutionality of checkpoints in the US. Um, for the camera, I don't know if the room picks up what people are saying, the questions. It does. It does. Okay, so the question is, what about the constitutionality of checkpoints? Technically, the law, I believe, that justifies the checkpoints is that there's a cert certain miles, and you might even know better than I do, a certain number of miles from the border, you're still considered to be in a border area. At the border, at an airport or a land border or a seaport, you're not in the United States and you have limited constitutional rights. And that's for everybody, that's me too. You know, they can detain you, they can ask you questions, they can strip search you, whatever they wanna do. You have limited constitutional rights until you're physically within the United States. Um, I believe that the checkpoints are considered legal. I believe they're a pain in the neck because they catch a lot of my clients. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, there's, there's some videos on YouTube, have you seen them, about people who go through the checkpoints and they refuse to answer. Um, I think that if you can go through the checkpoint and you can refuse to answer and you can, and you can cause a scandal and they're subject to, they are subject to legal debate. But um, being in Miami, surrounded by water, we don't, we don't really have the whole checkpoint issue come up. I have maybe three times in my career filed a motion to suppress an immigration court because I believed the stop was illegal and, um, and I prevailed. So I think even at a checkpoint, the officer has to have an articulable suspicion that you're in the United States illegally before they can ask you for identification. ICE is also all over, have you studied this, bus stations and train stations and they will go up to someone and say, oh, Minnesota, 25th anniversary. You look like a foreigner to me. Where's your identification? You don't have to answer. 
You have a right to say, I'm sorry, not today, and walk away. You don't even have to say that. There's a lot of illegal stops, a lot of constitutionally illegal stops. But once you decide to engage in conversation with the officer, you've waived your constitutional right. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Do you think that state or federal law is more like a pain in like in your experience? Like Arizona had their SB 1070 or whatever it was. Arizona has a, a lot of, of really harsh laws regarding immigrants. Um, in Arizona, if you're just a civilian, you have a right to go up to someone who looks foreign and, and demand their ID. You could be a cashier at a grocery store and be running the bread and the soap through and say, you know, where's your ID? Um, I don't know why Arizona is, is like that. Um, they should have a lot of Mexican Americans and a very heavy Hispanic presence there. Although unfortunately, sometimes I've noticed that the one who gets through the door first is the first one to turn against the one behind him. Um, I'm very involved in driver's license issues in Florida, and that is state law. I think that the states are less sophisticated than the federal government when it comes to dealing with immigration issues, but primarily my practice is federal law and dealing with the federal government. Um, and, I, and I like that. I think that's a better, more challenging, interesting area to work in. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thanks. I've said I've said a lot. There's no questions or anyone anyone want to say that they're opposed to legalization and, and explain why? Anyone want to express that they think we need legalization and explain why? Yes, sir. No, no questions. Okay. All right. Um, you seem to get very close to your clients with your with your talk. I wonder if your if your job ever gets too hard. You know, if you lose a claim like a case and are detained or deported, that kind of what that are you a psychology major? Because I could use some therapy. <laughs> My job is, is very hard, and it gets very stressful. Now, I think while working on cases, I, I really don't get too emotionally involved, and you can't. You, you can't get too upset. Like, my daughter burst into tears. I did not, and I didn't feel like crying because I knew what to expect. Um, I try not to get too emotionally involved in the cases, but even at an intellectual level and a detached level, it's very, very stressful. You're dealing with people who are detained and they're not detained for crime. I mean, if you're detained for crime, well, then you got to do the time, but you're talking about people who may have committed a crime and were convicted but now their penal sentence is over and they're still detained. Or they've never committed a crime and someone came knocking on their door at five o'clock in the morning and dragged them out of their home in their pajamas and handcuffs and locked them up and they've never committed a crime. And then you're dealing with people who are maybe abroad trying to get a visa and they can't get back in and they can't get the waiver. Or you're dealing with a woman who was extremely abused and the victim of domestic violence in Guatemala and maybe was raped at the age of 14 and became pregnant and bore a child or came to the United States and married an American citizen who abused her and said, I'm going to beat the crap out of you and if you have a problem with that, I'm calling immigration. So, and then I have to keep my eye on that darn visa list. <laughs> <laughs> and see what the numbers are. It's very stressful. Some days are less stressful than others. I, I think I maintain a pretty good emotional detachment for the most part. But some of the stories really touch me. You know, we call it, it's a sports metaphor, for, I guess, but we call it the agony and the ecstasy. You know, you work really hard, you have a great case, you win, you're so happy or you go in front of a horrible judge, you have a bad day, the moon and the sun and the stars, they do not align, you lose, you've been robbed, and you feel horrible about it because somebody's life was hanging in the balance. So yeah, it's, it's, 
it's very stressful. I mean, the career of law, if you're going to work with clients, is challenging. It's extremely rewarding. I highly recommend it, but it is stressful. But it is stressful. Yeah. Um, I plan on studying immigration law. Yes. Woo. So, um, I, I just want to know. I like you. If you have any advice for you know a burgeoning student that wants to go into law or going you know things outside going to law school. Do I have advice? <laughs> Does shy Mary Kramer have advice? I do have advice. Take Spanish. In fact, everybody really, can I say this? Everybody needs to study Spanish. Just my opinion for the cameras. It's not the official p position of CSB or SJU. I, I, I think that we're becoming a bilingual country and the person who speaks Spanish is gonna be the person who gets the job. But especially, <laughs> but especially if you um, wanna practice law. You know, and there's many, there's many kinds of law, but you've said immigration law, so I think you should learn Spanish. Um, what's your major? Hispanic studies Spanish. Okay. Get a minor in English. <laughs> law is a lot of law is a lot of uh, writing. <laughs> law is a lot of uh, reading and writing, and when you're done reading and writing, you read some more and then you might have to write. Um, so I really think English, history, political science, anything that involves a lot of writing is, is good. Um, travel. And, and I, I think that um, immigration law is only gonna grow as a career, and it's a good choice, and I'm not biased. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I am wondering if you have heard of Sonia Nazario's piece, Enrique's Journey. You started out <coughs> this evening talking about young people and your daughter's experience. And I teach over at St. John's Prep, and I am in English. And I just finished reading this piece with our students. And I know it's becoming a popular piece um, in freshman symposiums in colleges and universities and high schools throughout the country. And so I'm wondering if you've read that piece what you thought of it, you have? I have some good news and, and bad news, primarily bad news as an answer to that. I'm the president of Catholic Charities Legal Services and every year we have a big fundraising event. Two years ago, um, she was the guest speaker and they showed a film based on um, the book. And I heard it was really good, I missed it. My son had a swim meet and I chose to go to the swim meet. Um, so she's very well recognized in the, in the immigrant community and the legal services field, and, and I know she's very much admired. Um, and, you know, right now the problem of unaccompanied minors <coughs> is huge. I mean, right now we're sitting here, we're talking, a couple of people are leaving for the bus, that's okay. Um, and there's, there's a 14-year-old crossing the border at night, right now. And there's, there's children that are being abused by the coyotes. Um, and it's not exactly human trafficking because a lot of them want to come here. Human trafficking is a huge issue also. But there are just people who have a fantasy of what is the United States and they're, they're desperate to come here and they take their lives in their, into their own hands to do so. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Dr. Prevo. You raised the legalization versus citizenship issue. And there was a moment here a few months ago when it looked like that might become a very real political conversation. Because there's evidence that the Republican caucus meeting at the end of last year agreed that they could go for legalization as long as it largely barred ultimate citizenship and that that was potentially the route to go, and partly based upon the very heartfelt statements you were making about the real desires of many of the people who were in the United States without papers. Uh, what's your view about that? I mean, it caused a firestorm because immediately those <coughs> most of the immigrant rights groups said, 
going that route was going to create second class citizens. Now the issue ironically didn't come forward because the Republicans couldn't even agree among themselves to go for legalization, but they may yet figure that out. So I'm just curious, when you raise it, uh -huh. how, how do you see that playing out? I still think the terms, in fact I know the terms of vocabulary are being misused. Legalization means being put on a pathway to permanent residency. And I advocate for that, and I believe in that. Legalization means you become a permanent resident. And then naturally, after five years, you can become a citizen. Talking about the citizenship is really a red herring. Aside from legalization to permanent residency, Congress is talking about a guest worker program for people, primarily from Mexico and Central America, that would really like just to have a one or two year pass to come and work and then return to their home country. I guess what I'm trying to say is people need permanent residency. Citizenship is something else. And everyone who becomes a permanent resident will automatically become a citizen. So it ends up being a bit of a misnomer. The other thing I want to say is that if you cannot agree on complete reform, the majority of the people here who are undocumented do have family members or job offers and could be sponsored. And in the spirit of compromise with some tweaks of the law, we could take care of most of the undocumented people. But nobody's even talking about that. It's not even on the table. And I don't know if that sort of answers your, your comment. I don't believe in creating a group of second class citizens. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the political discussion misuses the vocabulary. It's not using the proper vocabulary. And I think it's misleading the American people. Because pathway to citizenship is really not what it's, not what it's about. It's a pathway to residency. And we need to give people the opportunity to become permanent residents. And then citizenship will follow. Yeah. I have a very similar question to that. And an issue that arose in my head in talking about was what could have potentially divided the Republicans on their stance and what would have uh, stopped the bill from proceeding would have, could have been big business in the private um, private the prison industry. Summit. Yeah. And if you give or grant legal residence and permanent legal residence to uh, this group of private or previously illegal or criminal uh, citizens or um, aliens or immigrants, or whatever you, you know, want to call them, how would that affect the quotas that need to be met with the big businesses? And then that would that turn some Republicans or any senators representatives represent away from potentially harming their lobbying funds and these big businesses that are helping them you know, remain in office? So exactly your question is, what does immigration reform and legalization mean for the people who have been on the waiting lists? My question is, could a real uh, I see. not want to proceed with yes. the bill because they would lose their business? Yes. What, um, what the student is saying is there are interests in American society that don't want to see reform because all of these people who are right now are illegal and um, candidates to be arrested and detained will no longer be detained. And that's very bad for the private prison industry and the jails that have contracts with ICE. Um, and and in, my, in my reading and my research and a group of attorneys from AILA, from my attorney organization, we're going to be at Congress on Capitol Hill next week lobbying. And one of the issues that our group really wants to put on the agenda is the private industry, prison industry, and the detention issue. So I've been reading up a lot on it. It's something that really, really bothers me. It, re it really bothers me that you can make a profit out of detaining human beings. And I think that the detention of human beings, be it penal or immigration, should be um, done by the government. I don't think it should be privatized, and I don't think prisons should be bought and sold on the stock market. Um, but one of the issues that I'm reading is that they're lobbying against immigration reform because they want these bodies to be arrested and moved into their prisons. 
And it's extremely expensive to detain people. It's extremely expensive. So we have all these unemployment numbers and we're cutting off extended unemployment compensation and, and the schools are failing and, and you know the infrastructure is weak and we pay what? What did the slide say? $157 a night to detain somebody. Is that what you want to spend your taxpayer money on? And immigration, ICE, they have options. They have alternatives to detention. They have a whole big program, which is also money, involving electronic monitoring where you put an electronic bracelet on the person's ankle and you make them call in. And, and, and once a week they have to report. It's kind of like probation. It costs like 25% or 20% of what detaining someone costs. And you know what? It works. The idea is we'll put an electronic bracelet on them, we'll monitor them, they have to report, they're in deportation proceedings, if they lose their case, we make them buy a ticket, they have to go to the airport, we meet them at the airport, we've monitored them the whole time, and, and they're deported. And you know what? It works. The people do not abscond. And they're able to be with their family and they're able to work. It introduces dignity into the process. So why, I mean, does anyone here have a job outside of school? Raise your hand if you have a job. And, and they take taxes out of your, your check. You might even be working part-time, but they take, you'd probably like that 40 or $50 a month that they're taking out of their, your check, right? It's going to a lot of things, obviously. I don't want to be too simplistic, but do you, do you want to detain this guy who doesn't have a criminal record? When we could put a bracelet on him and make him call in? And it, it costs money. And I think we have so many other needs in our society. I mean, whether you're conservative or you're liberal or you're somewhere in the middle, I think it's a no-brainer. Any other questions or comments? I enjoy immigration law. I enjoy what I do. Um, being at St. Ben's and St. John's was a magical time for me. I learned a lot. I learned how to write from Isla Perlmutter. I learned to think about the world and injustice from Dr. Gary Prevo. Enjoy your time here, you're very, very fortunate. And thank you for your attention.